good to know the formula here. Um, so the topic I'm going to start with is uh, giant light bulbs. Um, and I'm going to explain what this word is exactly. Just a bit of a broader overview. Um, there's quite a bit of overlap, I believe, between the topic and myself and I think you will be discussing. The difference being that I will be discussing quite a few aspects of the distributed theory of this. Whereas I mean, Q will be focusing more on the QFT, gauge theory, incredibility side, side of things. Uh, so what are giant magnets? So giant magnets are giant classical solutions, classical string field solutions. Of ABS5 cross X5. Um, and specifically on what's called the R cross these two subspaces of ABS5 cross X5. Now, for those of you familiar with the ABS CFT correspondence, this should be quite well. We're studying string theory of ABS5 cross X5, so this should be due to something that N is equal to the cross of even balls. And specifically, these guys are due to um, <coughs> single trace operators. With a small number of impurities. So I'm going to be thinking of operators with a large number of, uh, say, Z fields, and then a small number of Y impurities. Now, Y giant, well, this is going to be clear once you've got another solution. But it's because they are microscopic on the scale of the S2 on which they are. And this will become quite clear when we write these solutions down. So they're giant in comparison to the length scales that we find in these uh, geometries. And now, where does the platform parts come in? Well, I see that these are due to single trace operators. And you can show further that these single trace operators, I can think of excitations of some spin chain. Um, of the spin chain. And typically when you study excitations of the spin chain, you refer to these as magnets. So I think of these as having some um, spin, yeah, some uh, magnetic charge if you will, and that's where the name magnets come. So in a sense the word giant magnets or the name giant magnets is quite clearly chosen in that it tells me something about the string theory aspects of these solutions as well as what do they mean in the dual uh, gauge field picture. So the name in the sense is a bridge between these two different pictures. And as I said, in the NQ's lecture, you're going to be hearing quite a bit on spin chains. Uh, hopefully at the end of the lectures I'll be able to comment on uh, some aspects of these as well. And the ones that are relevant. But for most of the lectures we're going to be studying classical string theory, specifically on ABS5 plus S5. And in the tutorial we'll also get a chance to not just look at the giant magnet solutions, but really get your hands dirty while working on other solutions on this place. And uh, you know, uh, uh, sometimes you know, it can be a bit of a daunting task, but I'll you know, give you all the guidance if you need to solve them. And if you make appropriate uh, assumptions about what the solutions it puts you look like, uh, then you usually find that these problems are quite in fact solvable. So when I say classical string theory, what what does that what does that mean? So what I first need to do is just go through the classical string actions, first just a view of what I mean by classical mechanics, um, you know, in an action principle, and then write down the appropriate actions for string theory, which I think some of you might be familiar with, but I just want to give you a heuristic derivation as well, just sort of go all on the same page. So, when I think about the uh, word classical here, what I typically have in mind is some action, all right, um, and of course I have in mind some Lagrangian, that can be some, you know, function of some fields and their time derivatives and so forth. I'm taking some integral of the time. But to write the equations of motion of this, of course, I need to take functional derivatives of this uh, action with respect to the various fields in there. If I've got n different fields, I'm going to get n equations of motion coming out of this. And I typically set this equal to zero. Alright, now, of course, if I have a time derivative, this is going to be something like you know, take the functional derivative with respect to the time derivative field and then take the time derivative of it afterwards with the minus sign, but this will become clear um, shortly, a few examples. Um, uh, this is, of course, I think you're all familiar with how you treat a typical mechanical system. Um, in general, relativity is, of course, different. Um, there, I'll have some Lagrangian. 
and associated with that there will be some action. And uh, what is the Lagrangian that goes in here in the general relativity context? It's something like the length of the wall line of a particle moving through some geometry. Now, how do we figure out what this is? Well, let's just look at flat space as a first example, just to keep things simple. So imagine I have some three-dimensional space time over here. A particle starts at time t1, goes up to time t2, and traces out some line in the space time. All right. Now, this is three-dimensional, so you know I need to say, that, well, this is a one-dimensional line, but it's living in a three-dimensional space. So I have some set of embedding coordinates for this, x mu. And this is a three-dimensional vector that tells me at each point in time, where am I along this line? All right. Now, to figure out the length of this, I'm going to have to do something like, say, you know, make a small move along this line, and then make a, you know, sort of a dot product of this with the various components. And you can convince yourself that the appropriate expression over here for the length of the world line is something like the square root of dx over dt dot dx over dt, if I'm thinking of the flat space. All right. So there's a vector that tells me that dx over dt, I'm going to move in this direction along the wall line like a time derivative. I want to figure out the length, I need to take the dot product of it, and take the absolute value of it. This is in flat space. If I go into a curved space, all I'm going to need to do is take this dot product and replace it with uh, the general product in, in this space. So I'm going to take something like dx mu over dt times dx mu over dt, and then contract this with the metric tensor that I have over there. Alright. I need to take an absolute value. It turns out that if you're looking at a negative signature space time, there's a minus sign. I will take the square root. And the action is just the integral of this with respect to time. Alright. So here I've figured out what's the length of the world line within some curved space time. Uh, if you write in the equations of motion of this, um, of course, as I mentioned, you're going to take functional derivative with respect to the fields. In this case, the fields are these three components of your vector, the wall line. And uh, in other words, you're going to get three equations of motion. And they are going to be something like uh, the derivative of this Lagrangian, um, that I'm just going to say GR, with respect to each one of these components, it's alpha minus the time derivative, whenever I see a time derivative of these, dLgr over dx alpha dot must be equal to zero. And of course, this is a three-dimensional, or the picture I drew is a three-dimensional uh, vector, so I'm going to get three equations of motion coming out of this. If I'm working in a high-dimensional space, of course I'll get more equations of motion than I need to satisfy. All right. So this is what I think of, and um, if you go about, and it's a useful exercise, which I'm not going to do, unfortunately, but uh, you can study these a little and figure out that if I'm looking at a free particle that's moving through the space-time, not under the influence of any other forces, so that's what we described by this Lagrangian, then the equations of motion are solved by the geodesics of your geometry. This is, of course, exactly what we expect, and this is the way we understand gravity in a modern context, that you know, I insert some matter, this curves the space-time, and three particles are going to move along to d 6 of the space-time. Right. But of course, we're not interested in point particles. We're interested in extended objects. We're interested in how do I describe strings in a, you know, in a, in a classical uh, mechanical context. So, the way to do that would be to say that, well, previously I thought of one dimensional particles, so these moved along world lines. These were, of course, described by some you know, vector components that were functions of time. And uh, what we're going to do is say that, well, there's an additional dimension. You know? This is not just a point particle. It's going to have to be some embedding coordinates, it's not just a function of time. I'm just going to change the notation slightly and call this tau. 
Um, and there's also going to be some parameter describing you know, the extent of this object in space time. I'm going to call this. Right. And I'm not going to go to a world line, but rather it's going to be some world sheet. This thing is mapping out. So if you want to do a picture of this, I'm unfortunately a terrible artist, but it should look something like this. Well, I previously had a world line starting at a certain time and ending at another time. When I start at the initial time, I'm now going to have to think of, you know, let's say it's a closed string, so I'm going to think of some closed loop of some shape. And then as I move with time, it's going to end up at a different shape, maybe just to a we get a circle over there, and then of course it's going to look something like that. So it's like this deformed tube moving through the geometry, through space time, and I have here. So this is at the initial time. I think of some slice. This thing is a certain shape described by, you know, it's a function as a function of sigma, and it ends up at a, in a different shape potentially, as it does this. So analogously, what it did previously was to say that. The action is proportional to the length of the world line, traced out by this point particle. In this context, I'm going to think that the action should be proportional. Um, I shouldn't actually put an equal sign here. It should be proportional. I'm going to figure out the proportionality constant you know, from uh, some dimensional analysis, but nonetheless. So we're just going to ask, what's the action proportional to? In this case, it's going to have to be equal to, proportional to, the area of the world sheet traced out. So when I say the world sheet, I really mean the outside of this tube is this area that I'm thinking of. And how do we figure out what the area is, is given by? Well, again, flat space is a useful place to start. Um, if I think of flat space, and uh, you know, I have this tube over here, and I want to figure out well, what's the area that a string like this traces out. Let's take the string at some time t0 and let's say that it moves forward a very small bit of time to you know so I focus on one point of the string for example that's going to move forward in time by this little bit um, and this is of course going to be described as before by dx over dt All right. But I'm also going to have another component where it traces out an area, and that's going to be something that tells me what's the, you know, the tangent of the string at this point. And that's going to be dx over the sigma. Right? And this is going to trace out some area that's roughly going to look like this, a very small area, dA. So what do I need to do in order to figure out what this area is? Well, I need to again take a, or at least there's a, you know, some kind of group. I think you study first in linear algebra, but what I need to do with these two vectors to figure out the area that they span, I need to take a cross product. So I need to take dx over dt and take a cross product with dx over d sigma. And uh, to get the area, I need to multiply this again by uh, d, we just say tau, and d tau and d sigma. And I'm just going to figure absolute value of this object. Yeah, just figure out what's the size of the area that I'm working with. Now, if I take the size of this, um, you of a cross product, you can, uh, I think it's well known that what you get is just dx over dt, it's magnitude times dx over d sigma times the sine of the angle between these two vectors. This is the size of the area. And then I'm going to multiply this by d tau d sigma. Um, now I'm going to manipulate this expression a little bit by writing sine theta as 1 minus cos squared theta, uh, the square root of that, and then taking this inside the square root, we get the following expression. It's the square root of absolute value of dx over d tau um, squared dx over d sigma squared, and then minus cos squared theta of the same thing over here. So I'll have absolute value of dx over d tau squared, absolute value of dx over d sigma squared. All right. 
And um, as I did previously, I want to write this in terms of a dot product. This I can do quite successfully. I'm just saying this is the square root of dot product of dx over d tau with itself. Multiplied by dx over d sigma of itself. d sigma dot dx over d sigma. And uh, this expression I have over here is the square of dx over dt dotted with dx over d sigma. <coughs> dx over d tau times dx over d sigma squared. Alright, so this is the expression for flat space. And what I just forgot here is I need to take the absolute value of what is written inside the expression of the value. Alright. So as we did with the uh, world line, uh, coming from flat space to a general curved space line, I just need to replace the dot products with you know, a contraction with a general metric tensor. So the final action that I get should be something proportional to the integral of a square root of, <coughs> first I'm going to take dx uh, mu d tau times dx mu of the detail, I'll take that with the metric, multiply that with dx mu, uh, maybe use a different symbol there, dx alpha of the d sigma times dx beta of the d sigma, I'll take that again with the metric tensor, minus <coughs> dx mu over d tau, and dx mu of the sigma, g mu mu, everything here squared. I need to take the absolute value of this, and it turns out that for, again, a negative signature metric, I need to multiply this with an overall minus sign. Alright. Now, this is a bit messy, but everything up in here is an unneeded square root. Um, I can write a bit of a shorthand for this because these expressions get a, a bit messy. The square root of minus g of oh, okay, so whole sheet, d tau d sigma, where this is called the induced wall sheet metric, and this is given by g wall sheet. And I'm just going to convert to a uh, shorthand, just say x dot dot x dot, x dot dot x prime, x dot, or oh, let's say x prime dot x dot which is of course the same as the component of the day, and x prime dot x prime. Alright, so um, I, when I say the dot product here, I really mean a contraction with the metric, so an expression like this. A dot represents a derivative with respect to tau, and a prime represents a derivative with respect to sigma. If I take the determinant of this object, I plug it in here, then I get the appropriate expression for uh, the action. Alright. This is called the number go to action. I hope that some of you have seen this before. And um, as I said, we got to this with a heuristic argument by just taking an analogy with respect to how do I treat point particles moving through some curved space time? What's the action describing those? By analogy, I'm just going to have some area traced out by these extended objects. And uh, this is how I derive this action from here. Um, and it's going to turn out that the solutions we're interested in can be found by just studying the number go to action. Um, however, for the sake of completeness, um, I'm also going to show you the polyograph action, how, uh, what that is and how that is related to the number go to action. Um, the reason being that in practice, the square root that I have in this action over here sometimes causes some problems. Sometimes uh, it makes it a little bit more difficult. And the equations of motion can become more complicated, unless you're looking at very specific examples, like we will be doing. Um, so, the Polyakov action is Polyakov. It's going to be proportional to the following action. We have d tau, d sigma, 
square root of the absolute value of this h. So I'm going to explain all just now and tell you exactly what it is. Multiply by g mu mu dx over d. Uh, oh, let me actually just do the short down here. The a x mu the b x mu, where a and b run over tau and sigma. And um, this h that I have over here, you can think of as a dynamical induced wall sheet matrix. So this is the wall sheet matrix I have, but I'm giving this some sort of dynamics. This is now really a field that I have to minimize the action to with respect to the wall. And when I do that, I'm going to get additional equations of motion. I'm going to get TAB is equal to DAX mu uh, DB X mu minus a half HAB HCD uh, DC X mu D D X so these are additional constraints that I need to satisfy in addition to the equations of motion for each of the x's describing uh, the invariant coordinates. Um, and now these are called the Virasoro constraints. The And um, so the following is a useful uh, exercise that I'm just going to do quickly. Um, let's just define this object over here, this dA x mu, dB x mu. Let's just define this as some new <coughs> tensor x a b. So it's in the series tell me the derivative with respect to which I am taking this all the points. So then this should be the Yes, dB. Ah, yeah, that's right. Correct. Right. Um, now if I define this tensor over here, then I can show that this equation of motion, oh, this would be set equal to zero of motion. I can show that xab minus a half hab, um, and then I've got hcd xcd is equal to zero. Um, if I take this over to the other side, take the determinant on both sides, then you can convince yourself that the determinant of x and b must be equal to a quarter as the determinant of h and b times this object that I have over here, hcd xcd squared. Um, now I can obviously Solve this expression. I'm just going to actually introduce an absolute value in here. And uh, we can solve this to show that the determinant of H A B, its absolute value, square root, this must be equal to. 2 times the determinant of x a b over h c d x c d. And uh, this is, you know, this is the constraint I need to satisfy to satisfy the solar constraints. So let's just take this and plug this back into the action, see what we get. If you plug this into the action, the product of action becomes integral of the d tau d sigma. Um, now, this is the determinant of h and b. That's the object I have over there. This is equal to 2 times the determinant of x a b over h c b x c d. Or there I have a contraction of h with x uh, c d. So, <coughs> what I then get out is the integral of minus the determinant of x and b. I just introduced the minus because I said that there's a negative signature, but it's really the absolute value, uh, depending on the signature of the integrative study. 
But if you just substitute the definition back in of this object, it's going to be the determinant of dA x mu, dB x mu contracted with g mu. And this is exactly the number going to action. Alright, so as you can see is that when I get the point of action, I get these two additional equations of motion to give a silver constraint. But if I go about and solve them, then really I'm describing exactly the same physics as the number go to action. What I've gained in the process, however, is that in the number go to action, I have this pesky square roots in, uh, in the action. In the point of action, I no longer have this difficulty. The equations of motion for these guys will be completely linear. So you can think that there's a better hope of solving them. And that in addition to that, um, and this is something that you'll see explicitly in the tutorial, but um, when I solve the number go to equations of motion, I have a reparameterization in the area still left in the problem. So uh, you get, say, three equations of motion, but all three of them aren't independent. If I solve one of them, I get two of them for free. And this represents a reparameterization in the area that I have in the problem. In other words, I haven't told you what tau and sigma mean. Um, so I can say, for example, uh, you know, make a coordinate transformation, tau goes to tau prime, which is you know, a function of tau and sigma, and sigma goes to sigma prime, which is a function of tau and sigma. And this freedom is reflected in the problem. Additionally, the Polyakov action has a val invariance. And this val invariance is the following. If I take the wall sheet metric, H, A, B, and I rescale this with some scalar factor in front that is you know, a function of tau and sigma, H, A, B. This means that the inverse of this scales with the inverse of this uh, scalar factor that I have over here, tau and sigma. You can show that the action is completely invariant. So this reparameterization invariance in tau and sigma that I have, along with the volume invariance, implies that I can tune the solution in such a way that I can get any induced wall sheet metric that I want. A uh, popular choice for that is one that I'm sure that you've seen before, um, and it's called conformal edge. So for example, I can say that I want tau and sigma in my solutions, um, and vol and the vol um, factor here to be chosen in such a way that my induced wall sheet metric HVB must be you know, just something to be presented above flat space. That's what I want it to be in the end. What must x, x mu look like in order to achieve this? And that's what you go about solving them with the polar Um <clears throat> So in this case, the polar action actually becomes really simple. Um, so the polar action in conform gauge looks something like, I'm just going to again drop the proportionality constant. We'll discuss that a bit at a later stage. Well, it's going to be x prime squared minus x dot squared. And the Virasoro constraints are also extremely simple. It's just x dot dot x prime is equal to zero. And x dot squared plus x prime squared is equal to zero. Right. In order to get this form, I want to emphasize again that I've asked that the solutions for x that I write down must be such that the induced wall sheet metric is going to give me that form in the end. But in the polyp of action, this freedom is something that I can tune very naturally. Uh, in the you can the number go to action, you can do something very similar. There you've still got this reparameterization invariance. And one of the exercises I did this afternoon is to show that I can choose this reparameterization in such a way that I get diagonal induced wall sheet metrics out, etc. Okay. Alright, so are there any questions on these two actions that I've done? The number go to action and the polar action. Anyone? Anyone happy? Good. So now that we've written them down, the next step is just to say that, okay, well, we've studied them in general now, and I've told you that if uh, these strings move on some curved geometry, what, you know, what's the action that I need to write down? What's the branch of the system? Now we're going to say, okay, well, let's study a specific case that we're interested in. So let's go to ADS5 plus X5. Okay, so ADS5 plus X5 is a 10 dimensional space time. So 
So D is split. So I've got a total link scale sheet between a previous five part and this five part. And uh, of course there are many different ordinary parameterizations that we can use. I'm going to choose this one that shows uh, um, the different properties of previous five and this five nicely. Plus sine hyperbolic row e omega three squared plus r squared times cos squared theta phi squared plus d theta squared plus sine squared theta e omega three squared. All right. So this is the a part, and this is the x five part. As you can see, quite similar. With the difference is that. This one has hyperbolic trigonometric functions, the other one has trigonometric functions. This is a reflection of the fact that S5 is a compact space, whereas maybe S5 is non compact. Uh, but both of them have these three spheres living inside, just with a different scale setting the three spheres. This one, the scale is always going to be less than one. Here it can be really any, any other uh, up to infinity, depending on the value. Now this is 3 dimensions, so what this means in my equations of motion we're going to have 10 equations of motion that we're going to have to satisfy. In the case we're going to go to, these are non-linear as well. So these, as you can imagine, are quite difficult to solve uh, in general. However, um, the trick, as Vishnu also mentioned, to solving these is then to make a good guess for what the solution should be. Uh, in the context of the solutions you're going to be studying in these lectures and the tutorial, it's going to be about making an appropriate ansatz for these solutions. So the very first step we make is to say that, well, we've got 10 coordinates over here, but let's fix seven of them to be this. Some of them split. Yes, quite like that. There should be that symmetry between these two measures. So the first ansatz is that seven of these coordinates, I'm just going to say, well, so your row is equal to zero. I will stick with this slice in the metric or in the space time. Row is equal to zero. I'm going to pick a point on the three spheres. So I'm just going to represent that symbolically as omega three squared is equal to zero and omega three tilde squared is equal to zero. That already takes care of seven of the ten dimensions. So I'm just left with three. I'm just left with e is squared, and now this is what I refer to as r plus s2, r being the time direction, and s2 being the two remaining uh, radial directions that I have over here, phi and theta. The metric is just given by r squared minus dt squared plus the theta squared plus cosine squared d phi squared. Right. <coughs> So, this is the first thing. We just said that this is an answer to make. Uh, in principle, this is something that you need to be a bit more careful of. Uh, we need to show that this, you know, this choice, if I look at the full 10 dimensional space and I make this assumption, then this still gives me consistent equations of motion that I can solve with what is remaining. But you could just take my word for that. So, what I'm saying is that you need to write down 10 equations of motion. Isolate these three and show that these choices satisfy the remaining set. So that in other words, by making this choice and plugging it into the metric, i.e. into the action, that I don't you know, make the wrong assumption and the solutions I get are nonsense. But you can take my word for it that this, this is okay, you can, you can do this. Um, so we're not going to run into any issues. So if I write down these solutions of R plus S2, they are really solutions on the full radius 5 plus S5 just with these special choices for these components of the solution. So the next step would be to take these coordinates that I have over here. These are the ones describing the world, the embedding coordinates of my world sheet. So I've got t, I've got theta, and I've got phi. And I now need to make them functions of my world sheet. 
tau sigma. Tau sigma, tau sigma, and phi is a function of tau and sigma. Right, now, I've unfortunately erased the expression for the Alberto action. Let me just write the short term for that again. This is proportional to the tau d sigma of the square root of the determinant of the wall unit, g by the base. So the first thing we're going to do is just to figure out what the induced wall unit is in terms of these coordinates of function of tau sigma. So the wall metric. So if you write this down in general, I'm going to get the following t dot squared plus cosine squared theta d phi dot squared, ah, phi dot squared, sorry, phi dot squared, phi dot squared plus theta dot squared, and then over here I'm going to get minus t prime squared plus cosine squared theta phi prime squared plus theta prime squared. And in here, you're going to get a mixture of these two. And I don't think I'm going to have space to write down. But if I have a t dot, I'll get a t dot times a t prime, phi dot times a phi prime times cosine squared theta plus theta dot times theta prime times that. Right, so <coughs> Now we're going to do another step similar to what we did over here. We're going to use the repack organization in areas of the problem that, uh, that, uh, that I have. I'm going to say let's make simple choices for two of these coordinates. Simple choices in terms of the logic coordinates. So let's say t is equal to tau and phi must equal to tau. I think it's actually sigma minus tau. So let's make this choice for this. Here I'm using the VPAC mechanization variance that I have. I can choose two of these coordinates and give them a certain function of tau and sigma. You don't have to make this choice. In the tutorial, you will make a different choice and show that you get a different useful geometric out. But this is a choice that works out quite simply. So we're just going to stick with this. Now it turns out that the wall sheet metric takes the following form, really simple. Uh, actually, I'm not going to write the wall sheet metric, I'm just going to write the determinant. Um, for those of you interested, you can do this as an exercise. But the determinant of the wall sheet metric is going to be given by, I'm just going to put the minus sign out, cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta theta prime. Right. Oh, and um, what I've also assumed here, and this is actually quite key, so this is the repackmentalization invariance I've used. I'm also going to make an additional assumption on the solutions. And this is really what's going to pin me to the giant magma solutions. And this is that R, or in this case theta, sorry, theta is just a function of sigma. So it's not an exclusive function of tau. Uh, that's the answer I need to use. So I make this assumption. This is the assumption that's going to put me in the realm of the giant magma solutions. Yeah. This is then the determinant that I get out. So the reaction is proportional to integral of tau sigma square root of cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta theta prime squared. Oh, yeah, this one. Alright. Now, I'm going to make one more transformation, just to make that simpler. I'm going to define R is equal to cosine of theta. Um, if you look for the article where the solution was first written down, I actually make R is equal to sine theta, but we're going to get to the same solution at the end. Those thetas are just related by taking pi over 2 minus d theta is y theta, and we'll get the same solution at the end. So in this case, it actually becomes the following. Integral of the tau sigma square root of r squared plus r prime squared. Right. <clears throat> so this is the action. To get the equation of motion, I'm 
I just need to take a functional derivative of that action with respect to R. And uh, this is going to mean this is the Lagrangian, the square root uh, in the action. So we take the derivative of that Lagrangian with respect to R, and then subtract the derivative of that Lagrangian with respect to R prime, and take a derivative with respect to sigma. Alright, so I'm going to leave out a few steps here, um, but it's essentially just taking derivatives of the functions that you get. Keep in mind that R is a function of sigma. And then the expression I get at the end is R times R squared plus 2R prime squared minus R times R prime over R prime squared plus R squared to <coughs> 3 over 2. Excuse me. I think the derivative to sigma because we would say theta is just a function of sigma, right? Yes, exactly. Precisely. So, and, uh, I've, as I said, I've assumed that it's not an explicit function of so sigma. That's why the derivative of sigma. And uh, the upcoming lectures, we're going to generalize this a bit. And not just study giant magnons, but this, uh, look at scattering solutions. In that case, sigma is an explicit function of tau, and that we're going to need to take into account. However, the equations of motion that you get out from that are quite horrible. And uh, to solve that, we're going to need to use a few other tricks. Um, and, uh, well, I can tell you before about this, we're going to do a full my reduction, show that this problem that I have is really the sine order model in disguise, and that uh, the explicit solutions are horrible. Uh, but yeah, if I was to assume that the explicit function of tau, I need to include that as well. But T is just a function of sigma, that's why this appears as exactly. Now, as I commented before, because of motion forward and I'll go to action are typically nonlinear. This is exactly what you see here. With the R squared, the first derivative squared, second derivative multiplied by the function itself, and usually they're very difficult to solve. In this case, however, they can be solved. And the solution is actually quite simple. It's just R is equal to some constant over the cosine of sigma plus some sigma zero. So C and sigma zero are integration constants for this um, equation of motion. And uh, of course, to fix them, we're going to need to put down appropriate boundary conditions. Um, so <clears throat> the boundary condition I'm going to impose is the following. Um, I'm going to say that. Oh, and um, I'm going to say that these solutions, so I'm stating sigma to run between 0 up to some angle, but I'm going to pull delta phi. So when sigma is equal to 0, that's the one endpoint of my solution, and when sigma is equal to delta phi, that's the other endpoint of my solution. The other condition I'm going to impose is that r at 0, is equal to R at delta phi must equal to 1. Right. When I do a picture of what this means in terms of the linear coordinates, it's going to become quite clear why I made this choice. Um, but you can solve for this boundary condition and figure out that C must be equal to cosine of delta phi over 2, and sigma 0 must equal to minus delta phi. So that the solution for these boundary conditions are given by cosine delta phi over 2 over cosine of sigma. Sigma over like plus uh, minus delta phi over 2. Alright. So as you can see, if I said sigma is equal to 0, cosine of the negative of a number is just a number that divides it to be 1. And when I said sigma is equal to delta phi, I would end up this cancellation of r is equal to 1. So this is the solution in terms of the world sheet of the It's useful just to ask what does this mean in terms of the many components. So keep in mind that what I said is that whenever you see tau, think that this is time. And whenever you see sigma, think that this is phi minus time. So in terms of the many components, what I have here is that r is equal to cosine of delta phi over 2 over cosine of phi um, sigma.
multiply is equal to 5 plus t, and I'm going to subtract some initial angle of it. All right. So I was to draw this on, a, on the S2. Let's say I have a fixed time. Here I draw the S2. I pick some point in time. Then the solution start and end at R is equal with the R is equal to 1. I said R is equal to cosine theta. And what that means is that it's sitting here on the equator of this S2. And then I'll feel something like that. This is at a fixed point in time. But as time moves, the angle of course shifts. So this solution is rotating around the sphere as I evolve the time, but keeping its shape as a function of sigma. And these are the giant magnet solutions. So as I say, as time evolves, and the uh, holes <coughs> around the sphere, the endpoints are fixed on the equator, and R is equal to 1. And uh, this is what it looks like. Okay. Um, uh, so, as I said, these are the solutions in terms of these empirical coordinates. Um, and this is the picture of what it looks like. What I can also do is just say, but, okay, well, let's just take this and project this onto the plane that I have over there. So then I'll have, you know, this is representing R for me. And uh, to this extent that it curves over the top of the sphere, it's going to tell me that it starts at R is equal to 1, stretches to another point at R is equal to 1, and it's just a straight line. This you can also see from the fact that over here I have get R times the cosine of a function must equal to a constant. What does that mean? Well, let me just rotate this a little, and I'm going to get a circle. I'm going to get x and y. x is r times cosine of sigma. So this means that this is what the solution looks like on the r of phi plane that I have over there. And I can just rotate it to be represented by this straight line. But in terms of the full r plus x2, this is what the solution looks like. Well, I've got this two sphere parameterized by phi. Uh, theta and then of course time. And over here I'm just say, well, let's just get back with the rest of this in terms of R and phi, and this is what the solution looks like. Okay. I'm unfortunately not going to have time to study some of the properties of the solution. I'm going to leave that for the next lecture. But what we've done now is we've looked at classical string theory in general, specialized to the ABS5 cross S5 geometry. And said that, well, we're going to make a very special ansatz for the solution after. We're going to take these uh, assumptions for 7 of the 10 coordinates to be left with an uh, R cross S2 subspace. And then on that R cross S2 subspace, I used the parameterization variance to write it like that. And then I made a very special ansatz that theta must be of this form. So theta is only a function of sigma in these coordinates. So it's only a function of phi plus t. And this is what that enabled me to solve the solutions. Solve for the time level solutions. Now, um, in the tutorial this afternoon, I'm going to ask you to run in a few more solutions. So I'm going to stick with R cross S2. I'm going to make a different answer for these, and you're going to solve for those. I'm also going to give you the opportunity to look at a different subspace for ABS5 plus S5, but I got some solutions there. And in the last question, I'm also going to indicate that's the reason why these solutions, the giant manual solutions, are special solutions. Why they are special in the context of the ABS CFT correspondence. And why there's a suspicion that they should correspond to a very useful object in the duality. And uh, hopefully I'll be able to expand a little more on that in the next lecture. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, If I, I'm around, so you know, please call me at any time and ask me if you have any questions about something I did or you know, something that you suspect I plan to do. Please feel free to do that. Uh, we'll break now. I think your lecture is at 11.